Welcome to Bewilder Beasts. I'm your host, Melissa McKee McGrath, and today on Bewilder Beasts, we are going to explore dogs who find whale poop for science and why you might need to strip off your clothes for polar bears. Let's go. Hi, welcome back to Bewilder Beasts. Today's main topic is one that I got to present to kids at the Boston Museum of Science in February. They had this exhibit called Dogs, a Science Tale for a short period just as things were closing down due to COVID-19. And it was the highlight of my career to be able to bring my dog in to the Science Museum and talk about how dogs use their noses and how humans have figured out how to train them to help us. More on why we are teaching dogs to find whale poop in a minute. But first... Churchill, Manitoba has its very own polar bear police. And while I'm imagining polar bears in adorable little police outfits, that's not quite right. They have a dedicated police who help the public handle over 200 polar bears who come through their town of Churchill during a six-week polar bear season, where bears come through waiting for the ice to freeze on their way to find seals and other food. Obviously, the people who live here know the hotline for polar bear police by heart in the same way we Americans teach our children 911 for emergencies. And they also know what to do, unlike adventure tourists who come to Churchill wanting to snap photos of bears walking through a town. So what do you do if a polar bear jumps out at you near the pub and you forgot your phone? Strip. Yep, strip. I mean, I recommend wearing many layers so there isn't just one bear naked in the street. But that said, this technique really works. It turns out if you take your clothes off slowly and walk backwards also slowly and don't look the bear in the eye, you should be able to get away or at least buy some time to get to safety. So why does this work? Well, polar bears are really curious. They will stop to sniff each dropped article of clothing. Now let's hope that the person that you are visiting is used to this technique, or else a different police force will likely be called out. Um, hello? Yeah, there's another naked tourist on my front porch. That's a third one today. Now let's get back to why we're all here. Whale poop. Back in 2008, researchers in Puget Sound off of America's west coast noticed that killer whales were getting pregnant, which is great, but a large percentage of those pregnancies were ending in miscarriage. Otherwise put, the babies were not being born. They died in utero. So scientists, as they do, wanted to know why, but to find out, they had to find their poop. And given that these are whales, rather large animals, you'd think finding scat wouldn't be difficult, but it turns out it is. As their poop is the consistency, and this is gonna get gross, sorry, but you clicked on this, it's essentially the consistency of like algae and snot. A few of the articles I read said it was like egg drop soup. Ew. The other complication is that this liquid-ish gold to scientists sinks very quickly. So researcher Sam Wasser decided to bring out the big guns, Tucker a ball-obsessed black lab who, and I'm not making this up, was afraid of water. Selecting an eight-year-old aquaphobic dog to help marine researchers might not have been my first choice, but that's why I'm a pet dog trainer and not a scientist. It turns out, though, Wasser was onto something. With Tucker's drive to play with his tennis ball, he was easily trained to associate the smell of whale poop with getting his ball. And with Tucker's powerful nose, he could track it over a mile away. So let's just stop for a second. How far is a mile from you? For me, if I were to look to my left, it's the next town over. Behind my house, it's across a river. And my favorite donut shop is a mile to the right. Oh my God, I'm so hungry. Tucker has since retired, and there are dozens of dogs who now do this kind of work for researchers. But these conservation canines, sea canines for short, have other important jobs too. These dogs helped find injured koalas after the devastating fires earlier this year in Australia. Wasser has also been able to help prosecute ivy poachers in Africa, 
track wolverines in the Rocky Mountain region, and better understand interactions between wolves and caribou. These dogs can also find spotted owls, endangered giant armadillos, and some dogs can even identify 13 different species' poo. Conservation canines are doing amazing work, and no doubt we'll talk about more of them in future episodes. But why were there so many whale miscarriages? What did the scooped poop scoop? Well, they didn't have enough food. You see, an orca's primary diet is the Chinook salmon, and those whales are finding less and less due to overfishing, which is leading to more and more miscarriages. In addition, researchers can also track how humans are affecting whales through whale poop. For example, they can tell with the samples taken just after 4th of July weekend, when there are more boaters and human activity on the water, the whales have higher levels of stress hormones in their fecal matter. I wouldn't expect poop to paint a pretty picture, metaphorically or literally, and that's absolutely the case here with the case of the miscarrying whale pods. We humans are smart enough to train a dog who is terrified of water to find whale poop. I hope we're also smart enough to change our behaviors so we can address this problem that we are undoubtedly contributing to. There is always an exception that proves the rule. In this case, the rule is evolution, maybe? See, animals pass on traits, and over time, the traits that work benefit an animal and those who don't, well, But in the case of the pumpkin toadlet, their mating calls go literally unheard. Sure, many frogs don't have ears, but they can at least pick up sound waves. But not the pumpkin toadlet. They are deaf as doorknobs. But that doesn't stop them from calling out to their beloved lady toadlets. Wouldn't this be a disadvantage? I mean, if a frog was swooning like Barry White, couldn't it just be discovered by predators and eaten? Well, it does turn out that one benefit did creep through thanks to our old friend evolution. This teeny tiny toadlet is safety orange, a bright enough color to say, hey, I'm poisonous. And it's also not even a decoy. Researchers think that this amphibian is so poisonous, it has no natural predators. So maybe there is something to this evolution thing. So that's it for today. Thanks for joining me on Bewilder Beasts. If there are topics that you would be interested in hearing on the podcast, know of any historical animals who have changed the world, animals who help humans, or wacky animals in the news, then please send them in. Bewilderbeastpod at gmail.com. You can tweet me at Bewilderbeastspod. You can find me on Facebook, Bewilderbeastspod, and at Bewilderbeasts on Instagram. I'm Melissa McHugh McGrath with Mutt Stuff Media. Now go get curious. I got today's information from The Independent, The Siberian Times, Smithsonian Mag, NPR, The University of Washington Department of Biology, and IFL Science, because IFL Science. Links are in the description of today's episodes. Intro music is Tiptoe Out the Back by Dan Leibowitz, and interstitial music is by MK2. Sound effects today are by Andrew Duke. Don't forget to like, subscribe, review, share with your curious friends, and all that stuff that everyone tells you to do at the end of their podcasts. Thanks for listening. <laughs>